together once, um, maybe we just met like once, we just met us. <laughs> um, the first one is uh, about uh, students' papers and an old coffee mug. My students' papers lie on the bed in the sun like lazy tourists on a beach in Crete. I should clean up, but who would care? Third day of using. Third day of using the same coffee mug. The stains of coffee have accumulated in a smutty pattern. I continue to learn instead of finishing my book or grading papers while sipping coffee. I glance at the papers I ought to grade. Deadlines don't bother me anymore. Like people, they pass without saying hi or goodbye. I don't worry about the future. I'm just here with my black and coffee mug. I once had black and sea bass at a restaurant. Made of glass, it was raining. So long ago, so insignificant. The wine was from New Zealand. The bill was $84. Split in two, that was 42 for each person. I remember insignificant events. And numbers. The code on the door in New York was 8615. The number of the building in Boston was 1737. The room number was 354. I forgot the deadline of my students' papers. I remember how many hours ago I washed my coffee mug. The last sip of cold coffee is gone. I go to the kitchen and pour more coffee. Realize I didn't feed the cats today. Poor <laughs> cat in the bowl. Cat food in the bowl. Three one four two eight three one seven five nine was five phone numbers ago. Page five hundred ten. Kaplan's demonstrative is the monsters page. My book is due on New Year's Eve. At least I remember that. I never forget New Year's Eve. <laughs> or Christmas. They have significance beyond the student papers and deadlines. <laughs> they are two days that left traces behind that cannot be erased. I tried, bought a big eraser, erased your face. <laughs> but the head left you remains. I put you in a drawer without your head. Locked it. But I keep hearing your knocking. I don't know if I should let you out. <laughs> the next, uh, uh, the next one is uh, it's what I call. Um, um, random uh, ramblings. <laughs> yeah, it, it divided into sections. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> it's called How Many People Can a Body Contain? Why do people think I am but a single person? Is it because I have only one body? Do people take up so much space that the body can only contain one? Maybe there are a plethora of people following each other in a continuous number structure. Or maybe they're all inside me and at any given moment. <laughs> at any given at any given moment. moment. At any given moment. <laughs> at any given moment. <laughs> at any given moment. <laughs> Taking turns peeking out. <laughs> Am I still the loyal dog I was when I was young and unspoiled? Am I the person I was before I met you? Or did I shovel the layers away and duck out the girl who is standing here now? Where am I to find the answers? Is 
there even an answer? <laughs> Should it be a matter of preference? Then I prefer many to one. Okay, so uh, the, the last one we will read is written in the last three minutes uh, before we came here. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's about this conference, actually. And it's called The Rave of All Conferences, which I would like to thank Sarah Bernstein, who is not here, but that is how she, she was the one who came up with The Rave of All Conferences. So that's hers. So, yeah, so The Rave of All Conferences. Sitting in the audience. Sweating. Ice water in our hands. Sweating. Oral applause for later use. The rave is here. The rave of all conferences. Cactuses and scorpions. The rave. The war. Of the world views. The massacre. Of consciousness. DCs. DCs. DCs all over the place. The rave. Cactuses. Pricking your mind. Pricking. 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 Pricking the rave. The rave. What does it feel like? What is it like? Deepak Chopra and molecules. David Chalmers and mindfulness. David Copperfield, magic. David Cook and mockery. Don Corleone and the mafia. Disease. 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 All over the place. Disease. 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 Just plain out of luck. Ah, uh, 
Shucks. <laughs> Next two are for this evening. Tempest Fugit, Time, Time, and Knots, Distorted Dial of Moments and Days that Flutter Through My Life, as leafs through an autumn wind. No measure of work, responsibility. No need to measure berry making. And then for later tonight, a good bit later, the sharp, clear, the sharp, clear lines of definition that we walk under the watchful eye of the language cops when we're stopped after a night at the Socratic Cafe become a fractal enigma in drunken sight as we stagger, hopefully, through the magic night. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! 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 First poem I'm going to read is uh, called uh, The Sentence of Epiphenomenalism. The view of many scientists in this enlightened age is that all alone, each one of us is imprisoned within a cage, trapped helpless where we can't be heard in a way we don't detect, but which the laws of science today seem clearly to predict. As well as imprisoning us to add to our distress, the cage moves around, goes to work, succeeds or makes a mess, controlled by an autopilot or autopilotess, programmed to make choices in the program's interests. Now that might not be so bad at confinement. If it weren't, there were painfully made to feel each misalignment and rupture of vulnerable parts of this cage that's detected on its autopilot sensory gauge. And also for the fact that we know that we are dependent on the condition of this cage and its robot attendant for our own survival and quality of life, and for that of other prisoners perhaps a husband or wife. If it weren't for one small mercy, this would be too much to bear. And that's the blessing that usually we're blissfully unaware of this pitiable predicament of our captive soul, because we're made to feel that we're that pilot in control. This, at least for many, is what the laws of science show. Our free will's but an illusion that sensations bestow by accompanying activity in our brain's decision zone upon ourselves who then feels each decision as its own. That self, or consciousness, is the stream of our sensations, which must arise from physical events and brain cell formations in a way that scientists haven't yet been able to explain, although many feel confident it can't affect the brain. If consciousness can't affect the outcomes of events that decide what one does, what one encourages and prevents, then it's true to say that each of us is helplessly confined you feel as though you made a choice, but you couldn't have changed your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my next one's called, uh, it's uh, called a bit of a, an answer to the one that I've just done, is why I don't believe that epiphenomenalism is true. And it's uh, called uh, Mysterious Irresistible. I wouldn't mind, I appreciate a wee bit of uh, light touch because I find it hard to read. Uh, <laughs> 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 anyway, here it goes. It's called Mysterious Irresistible. Another slice of chocolate cake. A second delicious bite to take. Voraciously, I wolf my fill. Many scientists say I lack free will. That every bite and munch and swallow is caused by a chain of events that follow laws of nature of a kind that permits no influence from my mind. But as I eat this cake, I think, sipping a hot, refreshing drink. No theory of science, however auspicious, has explained what made that cake delicious. <laughs> ah, but surely sugar and fat made it sweet and sticky, and we all like that. But what is sweetness, and is it always appealing? The third slice gave me a sickly feeling. Sweetness itself is a mystery, but there's more to deliciousness than taste, you see. Accompanying the sweetness of my second sticky bite was a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of delight. A feeling can occur with any sensation, from the bitter taste of beer, to a spark of inspiration, to warmth and softness, it's often attached and even to pain when an annoying itch is scratched 
Some would say that feeling's my reward for doing good. A bribe to keep me feeding myself with energy giving food. But if I couldn't do otherwise, that view's not soundly based. And the feeling could only constitute a sort of aftertaste. Yet, it does seem to be a thing I seek like hidden treasure. So when do we have it? This mystery of pleasure. <laughs> often, when we, often when we do some things that... This mystery of pleasure. <laughs> Often when our body gets something it requires, or when we think that we fulfill one of our desires, but also when we do some things that benefit our genes, or laugh or dance, or win a game, or work out what something means, is there really no explanation? Must it be just luck that we tend to get this nice sensation every time we fondly unite in procreation? <laughs> Look, and as you continue to look upon each page within this book, know that what forms the image you see is to science an absolute mystery. The black of the dots and squiggles of ink, the paper's white and your hands skin pink, the colours of whatever lies beyond your page remain unexplained in this scientific age. At school you're taught in the science class, shine white light through this prism of glass. Now see, all the colours of the rainbow appear, for colours are wavelengths of light, my dear. Although convenient, this explanation conceals the fact that a colour is a sensation, and a wavelength of light merely an oscillation of force fields like other electromagnetic radiation. It keeps the student from wondering why. It's when he sucked electric signals have flown from his eye that he experiences colours as blue, white or green, without which nothing by him would be seen. It is clear that colours are more closely connected with events in the brain than with light detected, as when our eyes are closed in slumber, we dream in colours, so, so we remember. So often a science teacher claims it is plain that refraction of sunlight through drops of rain makes the colours of the rainbow emerge from white light. We shouldn't be taught that, though. It's simply not right. Yeah. <laughs> And thank you all for being here. You guys have made a place where I feel like I'm at home finally. Yes! You're welcome. I'm going to read one short poem that I wrote in 2007. It's called Genetic and Atomic. What could be more useless than this? What could mean more? As life congeals the ticker tape of memory, while I trace circles in the sand with my big toe, I rejoice for all things lost. What's the point of hanging on to the ugly, the ailments, the lovely, the easy, the legion effacements of truth, unity? Today I realize that the universe and I pass through one another like ghosts in a hallway. Before you could see me fumbling, stuttering across the byways of modern man like the wall of some idiot blueprint with life springing up all around me, and oppressive disquiet within. We went wrong with the bullets and stitches in a world unprepared for scars, with missiles buried in our backyard and the dead strung up like Christmas lights. But I realize now these were never really obstacles, just parts of our own deeper structure, and all our emotions are pearls unattached to their perfection. So if I could, I'd go back, back to the beginning, and write a new Bible. Or maybe I'll start today. Eat the apple whole and thank the snake. <laughs> hey everyone. I'm Sharon Huff and I have a confession to make. I am a Bruxist. A Bruxist. Oh, what? Do, you, do, you? No. do I have any fellow Bruxists? Go on. No. Be free. I know what you mean, but I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my dentist gave me the news. It sounded very exciting. It just means I grind my teeth in my sleep. And it turns out, yeah, you clench and grind, it's bad. So it turns out that there's some controversy, the psychologist can handle this, but some controversy about why we do this. And I'm quite convinced that it's conscious life spilling into one's sleep and working at 
itself out. This poem is all about what we do in sleep to express. So this is called My Life is a Bruxist. <laughs> Clop, clamp of teeth, horseshoe, gouged in skull's earth again, tearing up the hours of dirt, past the days of trodden to find what? Discarded book jackets, pencil nugs, doll's eye tortoise shell, ex-spouse, festering in gums fissures. It's all there in sodden, sullen flexing. Jaws, regular task, makes empty meals of day's fortune. Steady grit of sound masks the yearning backward dance. Night's rotary motion towards a new day pushes on, feeds my heart's halt and stagger. Uh, finding uh, God's perfect word. Come, Lucifer, free my soul. It's been trapped in good boy's room. It's time to claim myself. It's time to be whole. I came to respect God's design to be and play with space and time and become all. And another one. I'm here. This is me. It took a long time, painful mutiny, to fight the tyranny, them telling me who to be. Now I can see, now I can see, floating down the time river is not for me anymore. Floating down the time river is not for me anymore. Streams from my eyes saying goodbyes to my used to be. Now I am here, now is in me. As I stay naked in my emotionality, pure consciousness, child's innocence, I hope and trust you can touch my vulnerability gently lovingly forgiving me. Synchronicity, a star journey into you. Let go, don't hold back. And lastly, <clears throat> consciousness tripping. It's called And Words. He offered me a leaf like a hand with fingers. I offered him a hand like a leaf with teeth. He offered me a branch like an arm. I offered him an ar my arm like a branch. He tipped his trunk towards me like a shoulder. I tipped my shoulder to him like a knotted trunk. I could hear his sap quicken, beating like blood. He could hear my blood slacken like rising sap. I passed through him. He passed through me. I remained a solitary tree. He remained a solitary man. Thank you. This is my first poem ever. Wow. <laughs> So it's 
its, uh, its title is On Being the Heart Problem. <laughs> uh, or A Propagating Neural Spike Wave Ponders the Meaning of Life. <laughs> Consciousness emerges. Who am I and where? What is my nature? Do I have a body out there? Am I a collapsing quantum wave function? It would certainly explain my free will. Or am I a recurrent feedback loop that has taken the red pill? <laughs> the dancing qualia of my sensorium extend as far as the mind's eye can see. Something this magical could not be generated by me. Wait, here comes a wave of neural spikes. It's from the ventral visual stream. Let me ride this frontier of information. Perhaps it will take me into my dream. These propagating impulses, the electrical, represent colors and shapes. This one must be the blue hair of Aunt Mabel. That one, the red shirt of Uncle Jake. As we surf towards the frontal lobes, bifurcating parietal hippocampal, experiences feel more contextual, more significant, more intentional. Suddenly, we're heading top down. We must have become feedback, but when? Uncle Jake has moved now. He was just there, but that was then. This change must be reported. Who is in charge? I must make them see. But there is no one. So I will tell everyone, a global work, excuse me, a global workspace broadcast I will be. <laughs> Out to all brain areas I must send myself. I'll make sure that all will know. The world has changed. We must update our representations. We can't be slow. As I circulate and replicate, recurse and synchronize, I ask myself, am I here or do I fantasize? Have I become a strange loop? Perhaps I'm here to stay. Aha, that's it, I've always been here. There is nothing more to say. I have solved the paradox of existence by writing loops of reentrancy. Around and around I go, becoming, being, avoiding chastity. I must therefore be me. The problem must be hard, because how else could I be here if I was just a transient shard? classical theatre, and as the auditorium lights dim, a twilight scene emerges in a village somewhere in Europe on the cusp of medieval times as they transform into modern times. Retreating footsteps echo down the street as folk head home and candlelight illuminates village windows. As dusk falls and the full moon grows brighter, two learned figures can be seen approaching each other in an alleyway. The year is 1613, and a dulcet melody echoes through the darkness. <laughs> John Brown's body lies a mouldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a mouldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a mouldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Whoa, 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 forsooth, I say, who's singing such a wretched song? Ah, hello, mon ami. Is that the voice of Monsieur Shakespeare, Monsieur William Shakespeare? Very so, it is I, my man. And is that the voice of young Master Rene, the fruit of the loins of my old friends, the Descartes? Mais oui, mon vieux ami, c'est moi! Voilà! <laughs> Thou look old for a young man, my good fellow. Thine hair is turned white, thy beard is grey, and thy mind does not appear sharp. <laughs> It is the French wine, you know. Uh, yes, I, I comprehend thee. I have tasted of such myself. But why sing such a morbid ballad? I know it not. Wherefore didst thou acquire it? Ah, uh, sacre bleu! Firstly, the song was not morbid, but offers hope that the soul will survive after the corpus has Water. <laughs> Secondly, I got it from the future in a moment of precognizance. <laughs> Thou hast precognition? Thou wastrel and scoundrel. Tell me not thy lies. <laughs> ah, but they are not lies, my old family friend. The song is from the 19th century and tells of surviving spiritual sentience. 
And that is not all. No? No. <laughs> no? No. There is more. <laughs> then I'm putting that lips, my man, pray tell. <laughs> I kid you not, tis also true, a script descended from the blue, out from a wormhole did it come, writ in blood and signed by thumb, print on every page, it makes me mad, it makes me rage to think myself, I had not thought of such pure words so dearly bought, with loving labor, true and Please. What say then? Here, give it to me. Careful, my friend, it precious is. Thou shalt have it back in but a whiz. Here saith it, in jargon bold, that e'er is a tale abroad be told. Life after death shall be thy prize. Gird thy loins, don't agonize. Thy consciousness so precious now, wilt not wilt. The truth I vow is that thy mind, divorced from brain, will yet persist and rise again. Yes, from the ashes, phoenix light, the gamma waves begin to spike. <laughs> Lasting minutes as the ghost leaves the body, steadfast posts. <laughs> A ghost, thou sayest, glory be. And that's what comes of in me, reduced to spirit, not like thine drinking absinthe all the time, <laughs> but ghostly spirit, saintly soul, drifting worldly pole to pole, wondering where on earth he's at, for they say the earth's not flat. How oh, do you know that, learned bard? Ah, tis not a problem hard. <laughs> it came to me at breakfast bowl through yet another damned hole of worms in space. With science I cannot keep pace. A conscious being a century hence through space and time so thin yet dense. A man of letters, um, so and so. Yes, I remember Galileo. Oh, I have not heard of him, but dread if he wants to keep his head and his collar and his hat he'd better say the world is flat <laughs> if and riddle be thee brightened the inquisition is now enlightened no more burning at the stake or taking arms to money make all is sweet and lightness now spanish officials till and plough the fields and so barley wheat brew some beer and with their feet tread some grapes and look upon their produce, perfect Sauvignon. Oh, to speak of alcohol, a drug inspires me now to pull the plug on this conversation <laughs> and get us back to think upon this verbal letter from afar. The author left his door ajar. He speaks of tubes and tubulin, <laughs> language strange. It is a sin to use such jargon, is it not? Not tubes, but tubules, idiot. Whole <laughs> oh, hairs of microkind, the sort that fit inside your mind, within a cell, tight and true. Get it now? I don't think I do. <laughs> what is a cell? Forget it, mate. <laughs> Just go home and master. The plate of intellectual wealth that thou must eat for mental health. Uh, you are right, I am on the blink. Therefore, I am off home to think. Off home to eat some beans and spam. Off home to think. Therefore, I am. <laughs> You know, Shakespeare, I'm now aware I could really use that line somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the meantime, the soul of poor John Brown goes on and on above the ground while his tubules break apart. The quanta spin and bless my heart resonates with others remote, keeping his spirit well afloat. Soul goes on beyond the grave. That's the nub, my worthy knave. 
with you. The epistle says so clear, when life is gone, they disappear, waves around the head called gamma, where they sit in glorious glamour. Seconds to minutes they exist, then off they go to make a tryst with other <laughs> souls. It makes one think, reincarnation is not extinct. Ah yes, the concept occurs to me. The soul connects with the pituitary. <laughs> Mind and body yet remain linked together at the base of brain until we meet the dark grim reaper. <laughs> In the earth, deeper and deeper, rest our corpses green and cold. But our quanta, small and bold, emerge from tubules, micro size, and elsewhere. Metastasize. <laughs> <laughs> Thus our spirits, privy see, never die, nor you, nor me. We just get smaller, tubules then quanta. <laughs> <laughs> Life story. We're born, we grow. We love, but we all know that one day we must go. Oh. I'm going to be here. Woo. Okay, yesterday I went for a hike, it's been a Kenyan hike. It was a book for you with participants. It was a lovely hike and I got some inspiration for this poem. So the poem is called Sabina Kenyan Hike. Balancing on a water drop. The philosopher spoke about hot or not hot salts. While I was jumping down, attracted by the shadow of a lion, and fled in words without reference. The sun was shining bright, too bright. The moon no longer cared for me. Caught in his freedom, I longed for a deep, deep eternity, and stumbled in the black, shivering night. Blue moon, shine on my sandy walking trail. My legs are singing, hot quality in my way. Thank you. <laughs> Standoffishness. They drank a lot and bickered. Their gamma waves flickered, but they couldn't avoid some obnoxiousness. <laughs> Where's Sky? 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 Sky and the band are going to do a quick song. The judges are going to confer. Are there any more? God was bored for many, many millions of years.
Who shall therefore bring illumination to my soul, so lost in conscious thought? Who shall clarify my mind, and thereby cut dead short the agony that tortures me and leaves me feeling weak? Oh, would that I could clear the mud and take a blessed peak of that strange land. Lucidity, unconscious yet controlled by me, the owner of that world, whose beauties would unfold if I could press the magic key and transport to that land where I could fly and meet the queen who take me by the hand and get the servants make me tea and buttered English bun and she would whisper in my ear let's have erotic fun in charge of all that I survey in lucid dreaming land she'd make me king I'd be in charge of our fair England two flicks of eyeball EEG signals my lucid state to Steve LaBerge that I am in, the queen is now my mate. <laughs> All through the day we make sweet love, then night to fair sunrise, matrimony, ah, sweet bliss, the bed, of course, queen sighs. <laughs> but what hell's there? Doors open sharp, an angry gathered throng, they rid me from their monarch dear. Something's gone quite wrong. They pull me from my soft repose and take me to their lair. They hold my head and from the roots start tearing at my hair. I hear one shout, you lay about, do not abuse our queen. I awake, the lab tech smooths my hair and takes good care to clean. Electro jelly from my crown, it is a gooey mess. Gosh, that was stuck, she reassures. I pulled it hard. Oh, bless, I've pulled some hair out. Goodness me, do not get so upset. Ah, oh, Didums, did he have his dreamy spoiled? There, there now, don't you fret. Instead, take comfort, play with me. No need for undue stress. Lay back, relax, and loose your tie. Would it help if I undress? She stands there in her uniform, a nurse with stockinged leg. What's going on? My mind screams out, and many questions beg. Am I still in this friggin' dream? I've seen it all before. Total recall, existence, and many, many more. What should I do? Shout for help, wave eyeballs to and fro. Steve LaBerge, come to my aid. I shake from head to toe. Am I conscious? Do I dream? Well, damn, who gives a toss? Things never are quite what they seem. I think I'll cut my loss. The lab tech sweet, for when all's said, she is a comely sight. Perhaps I'll just forget my head and go with her. Night night. <laughs> I'm very reluctant to do this. I wasn't ready to speak in front of you people. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know what to say. I mean, I really don't know what to say. Um, 
It's my hammering headache, mine, yours, or ours. It's my powerless heartache, ours, yours, or mine. Should I chase my head on happiness and break my spirit? If I had a choice, if I chose what to happen, I should have realized a long time ago that meaningful solace lies in that impossible space in your me. Then again, it is my thinking that makes it so. Through the brain, and if I thought. 
Shakespeare. 